Well, hello, we are back. And if you're following along with my new um, series for fall of 2022, you know that I have promised to do the same case studies that I'm doing in my live class with you here. So I'm going to try to break these up into 15, 20 minute segments. And we're going to start practicing for some of the changes that are coming to next gen. So let's get started with a little bit of an introduction. So you can see today the, the changes that are going to make, um, the changes that are going to happen between what the test is today versus what it will be after spring of next year, 2023. And so this is really looking at um, just the changes that the NCSBN made, because what they found was um, students that are finishing nursing school are just not quite ready for clinical practice. And the current testing methods that they were using wasn't really evaluating um, that readiness for clinical practice. So you can take a look at this slide and see how um, the differences are. So we're really moving and all of these slides actually came from the NCSBN, which is who develops the nursing um, test, the NCLEX test for all of the United States. So if you are a nursing student and you're going to be taking the test anytime next year, uh, spring of next year, you will be taking the next generation version. And so what we are trying to do is really change our method of teaching. And instead of just um, giving you information and expecting you to memorize it and, and give it back to us, we're looking at the clinical judgment piece and what are we going to do with that information. And so I'm going to go through a couple of slides and we'll talk about how we're just changing that mindset. And, and we've been doing this for years, um, but we're really putting a lot of emphasis on it for those that will be experiencing the next gen test. So we want to first recognize cues. And I always say in my videos, you have to know what's normal in order to know what's not normal. And so um, when we are looking at a scenario, a case scenario, we want to recognize cues that are leading us to do something else. So we ask ourselves, is the information relevant or irrelevant? What is the most important information and what is of immediate concern? And then we're going to analyze those cues. So what client conditions are consistent with the cues? Um, is there a particular cue or subset of cues of concern? So I like to ask my students, which of these things is going to impact the patient the most? Or which of these things could potentially um, harm the patient? Uh, which of these things are going, which of these cues that we see right now need me to do something? So when we have defined our cues and then analyzed our cues, we need to come up with a hypothesis. What is the problem? Where are we going? So in labor and delivery, I start thinking, do we have clues or cues of hypertension? And if we have cues of hypertension, is this something that needs immediate attention? Like, are we moving into the stroke potential. And then if we, if I decide that we are, then I need to develop, does she have preeclampsia, which is a condition that happens in pregnancy. And if that is what I define as the hypothesis, hypothesis, I need to think to myself, what are my expected orders when I call the provider and talk about the cues that I've seen? And what would I expect them to order my interventions for this disease process. And then we're going to come up with a solution. And how do I expect those orders? So for instance, let's go back to the preeclampsia idea. I have someone who has extreme hypertension. I'm concerned about it because now it's moving outside of those normal ranges. I think there might be a development of preeclampsia. I would expect the following orders. I would expect labs to be drawn, potentially have a medication um, immediately to bring that blood pressure down and to administer a medication to decrease her chance of meeting that seizure threshold. So magnesium for seizure threshold, um, maybe hydrolyzine for bringing that blood pressure down and labs so that we can determine if she actually has preeclampsia. So once I have developed 
all of that, I'm going to come up with my solutions. What do I expect to happen immediately? Well, I need the blood pressure to come down. I want those labs to come back and I have to know what to expect out of those labs, which ones specifically am I looking for? And then um, my magnesium uh, uh, IV dose to bring that, that swelling down, I'm going to be swelling, you know, overall generalized swelling so she doesn't seize. Um, I, I'm going to expect that she tolerates that. And then I have to determine what that means. How do I know that she's tolerating that? What are the signs and symptoms I need to look for, for toxicity? So in my nurse's brain, I'm putting all of these things together to take all these little bits of information that I've learned about preeclampsia and move it into actually taking care of a patient at the bedside with preeclampsia. And then take action which one of those am I going to do first out of the three that I listed your, your orders for your labs, your hydralazine and your magnesium, which one do I want to do first? Well, I want to get the mag on board immediately, get that started because that's going to take some time to work and that's going to keep us from um, moving that next step, which moves us into a different disease process. And then I'm going to bring that hydralazine down I, or use the hydralazine to bring that immediate blood pressure down. And then I am going to get those labs drawn and wait for the results of those. So our take action is the next step. And then did it work? I need to evaluate, did it work? And if it didn't work, then I need to start back over with my, what are my cues? And what is my hypothesis? And then what am I going to do with that hypothesis? Where am I going to go with that? So it's just a different way of um, thinking about the whole picture. And by us talking about it and changing the way we teach rather than just the uh, straight lecture and it, intake of information on the student's part and then bringing that information back up to the surface, we want to know that you can do something with it. So what we hope to see is that by changing the way we bring this information to the student, that you can now change how you think about the whole situation. Okay, so then we're gonna, um, I think that slide started over there. So we're just going to um, look at our clinical judgment model. And that's pretty much what I just explained. And with all of this process, we know that there are a lot of other things going on at the bedside. For instance, we have a lot of environmental um, distractions. You don't get to sit and just have a textbook and, and try to answer these questions. We have a lot of things going on in our nursing unit. So we want to throw some of these situations into our learning as well. Um, looking at the medical record, maybe looking at trends of the labs. We're gonna go back to that preeclampsia uh, example, environment, bells, whistles, phone, um, people needing to ask you questions, call lights, all of these environmental issues might be going off. Um, looking at the client, what are we seeing with that specific patient that might interfere with us working through our clinical judgment process? What are the resources available to us? Are we short staffed? Do we have a provider available immediately in, in house or by phone? Um, looking at um, the task complexity, the, what I just mentioned about all the different uh, medications and labs that need to be done. Those uh, magnesium sulfate in most places is a two nurse double check. So I need two nurses now to come and do all the rights of medication administration to make sure that we're handling this high-risk medication appropriately. And then the time pressure of it. And then thinking about the other part of the patient load. So making nursing a little more realistic in nursing school is part of what we're trying to do to get you prepared to actually care for your patient load. So here's some ideas as we work through some of these case studies. This is what I'm going to be helping you do in this next little video series. Um, and like I said, I'm trying to keep these down to about 15 minutes or so. And I uh, recommend that you look at the recommended modules first. That's how we're doing it in my in-person class. And they're going through the modules. And then we're doing these case study type scenario, um, next gen clinical judgment process 
in class together. So then you you write your, when questions are asked, I'm going to recommend that you stop the video and you work through the actual answer. I am going to be giving the answer right away in the video. So you need to pause it so that you can do the process um, so that you can build this muscle memory and build these skills. I know the answers and you need to make sure that you can answer them without my guidance. And then you can just start the video and see if you were correct. And then the third step to this is if you didn't know the information or you weren't on the same page, go back to your notes your textbook, whatever text you're using, go back to the lectures, uh, anything that you didn't understand well, hand write things down in a notebook and try to fill in those gaps in that knowledge. And I think you're going to see that you understand things at a, at a much different level by working through these steps. Okay, so after studying module one, so module one for my in-person class is introduction to the specialty, then you're ready to begin this case study. And you know, in my module one, we really just kind of look at the history of where maternity care has been, where we are now, looking at our statistics, looking at some of those concepts um, surrounding maternal and, and newborn nursing care. And so we're going to try to um, incorporate a case study into that. So our first patient is patient A, and she's a 17-year-old teenager who thinks she might be pregnant because she missed two periods. Her last menstrual period, she thinks, was about three months ago. She states her periods are irregular. She complains of her breast being tender swollen with frequent urination and nausea in the morning. This is her first office visit, and she's not sure why she feels so sick, but suspects she might be pregnant. Her urine pregnancy test is positive. Her primary care provider orders a prenatal lab panel and a urinalysis. So as I introduce you to this patient, we're going to start working through some of our um, clinical judgment. So as we look at this patient, I'm going to read the rest of this in case you're listening and not watching. I'll read it to you. I want you to start thinking about bias. And we did talk about implicit bias in our module one. Uh, lecture. So you want to start thinking about which of these things might be points where somebody could have some bias against this patient. So let's continue and see what we learn about her. So she's a senior in high school who participates in several sports, including long distance running. A follows a strict plant-based diet. She denies alcohol use and does not smoke. She takes no medications except for occasional acetaminophen for headaches and ibuprofen for menstrual cramps. She's 5'4 and weighs about 105 pounds. Her BMI is 18.5, which falls into the underweight category. She did do a diet history as part of her intake uh, forms, uh, diet recall. And in the last 24 hours, she reveals a typical day's diet of a protein shake for breakfast, lunch with salad with beans, cheese and eggs, and then dinner with homemade rice with tofu and vegetables. She's had two male sexual partners and is not in a steady relationship with either one of them. A is tearful and verbalizes that she does not know how to tell her parents of this pregnancy. She thinks she wants to keep the baby, but would like to hear more about the adoption abortion options. So I want you to pause the video and spend just a minute thinking about which of these areas might bias creep up and really just ask yourself, where would, where, which of these items did you think um, there, you could have some bias against? And I also want you to think, is there any um, education that needs to happen with any of the things that she has shared with you if she decides to continue this pregnancy? Okay, I'm assuming that you stopped the video and we're going to move forward and let's see if you caught the same um, areas of bias that I did. So a senior in high school, being young, um, can definitely be a, a point for potential bias. And then what about being a long distance runner or following a strict plant-based diet? Um, she is taking ibuprofen. Is ibuprofen and Tylenol appropriate for pregnancy? Is that something that we need to be thinking about? Um, she does fall into the underweight category. 
is it possible that maybe she has a little bit of an eating disorder going on, being an extreme um, uh, athlete and following a plant, a very strict plant-based diet? Possible, maybe, and that could be a, a section for bias. Um, she has had two male sexual partners that could definitely be a, a area of bias. And she would like to know more about the adoption abortion option. And as a healthcare provider, as someone that is um, trying to develop trust with this patient, we have to take what we would do in our own situation with our own bodies and put it aside and give her the options and the choices that she's asking for that's our our ethical moral and legal responsibility doesn't matter what we would do with ourselves we have to support her and and let give her the information that she's asking okay let's move on what kind of care collab collaboration might we use for this patient when we think about education and anticipatory guidance who might we want to get involved with her care so again, pause this video and think for a minute when we think about who cares for pregnant women um, and teenagers, who might we get involved? Okay, if you're back now, let's see if you caught some of, oh, I didn't write them down. Um, so some of the people that we might get involved. Well, obviously, if she's thinking about adoption, we need to give her some information about contacting an adoption agency, a local adoption agency. Maybe asking her if she has a trusted friend or someone that she can um, take with her when she tells her parents of this pregnancy. Uh, what about announcing it to the two partners that she is involved with? That is another point that um, uh, she might need some support. Uh, the abortion, abortion option, depending on what state you live in, we need to give her the information so that she can have all the information in front of her and make the decision that's best for her. If she does plan to keep the pregnancy, we would let her know when her next visit coming back is, maybe social services. If she's at a clinic, there might not be a social worker there, but definitely getting her connected with um, insurance if she is not covered by a parental plan, getting her connected with the local Medicaid or um, Medi-Cal here in California, um, making sure that she has a connection maybe with WIC for food sources, and then just providing her what a good healthy diet going to um, my pregnancy plate uh, uh, is a, you know, give an idea of the types of foods that she needs to be eating. She's feeling nauseous right now, so it may not happen right now and then letting her know when she needs to come back to be seen. Okay, this is just the first part in a series that I'm going to be doing. So plan to come back and we're going to start working through some of the clinical aspects as you work through the modules. Take care and thanks for watching.